Oh, I love seeing this. Um, we've got people from Massachusetts, California, New York. Um, I see that we've got Yaz May Walsh joining us from um, Central New York State. So welcome, welcome. I'm, I'm really honored that everybody's here. And so, hi, I'm Amy Wenzel. If you haven't um, met me before, we specialize in consumer product businesses and in building them. So um, some of the folks that send us referrals are the a oh, couple of the sharks from Shark Tank, the United States Patent and Trademark Office has me speak at different conferences, and we get referrals all the time from intellectual property attorneys like patent attorneys and trademark attorneys. So with that, I want to just go over a little bit of logistics because we're adding a lot of people to these calls and um, the show is continuing to go. We do this every two weeks. So if you're not already on the reminders list, um, we will put links out to get you into that. And um, so logistics for the call. I'm going to do a little bit of content here at the beginning that is about merchandising and why it's important and what the heck it really is. And there's some really great statistics that I'm going to share with you. Now, I'm going to go through that and then I'm going to open up the different channels here for live Q&A. So you can ask me kind of lightning round style um, how this may apply to your project or anything about building your product business. Okay. So um, these are my service to you and a great way to get to know us and to, to find out what we can do and also to move your project forward. That's our commitment is to bring value and to serve people um, in the best way possible for everybody. So with that, let's dive in and get started. I'm going to just open up the uh, phone line for a sec and uh, if you want to say a quick hello and your name and where you're calling from, the phone lines are open. Um, so hi there, who's on the line today? Hi, Amy. Hi, Amy. from Cleveland. Uh, oh, we've got somebody from... Amy. We've got Cleveland. Who else? New York. New York. I think that was uh, Bobby Kankus a minute ago. Bobby Philadelphia. Oh, awesome. So, wow, we've got a bunch of people jumping in. Apparently, this is a really good topic. I'm going to um, mute everybody's line so we can go ahead and get started here because it's two after. So, for everybody who's watching us via Facebook, come on in. You could type things in the comment box on Facebook. They will show up, and I do pay attention to that. Um, and we do have the Q&A box on the webcast as well. So with all that, I'm going to do a little bit of defining what the heck merchandising is first. Okay. It's merchandising has two definitions. It's kind of like crowdfunding has become where there's, you know, one definition and then there's the second definition. So merchandising, if you hear it as a phrase and you're wondering what the heck it means. It's contextual, first off. So if you hear the phrase merchandising rights, that usually refers to um, creation of products from a licensed character or a film or some music or bands, okay? Now bands, when they look at merchandise, they call it merch and their merchandising accounts for north of 35% of any revenue from a tour that they do. So it's a very big chunk of their business and it generates a lot of their profits actually too. So merchandising rights is one definition. And like I said, that's the creation of products from licensed characters, music, films, etc. The second definition is the one we're really gonna dive into today. And that's the practice of displaying products in a way that it attracts and excites consumers and causes sales. And for it to be successful merchandising, it has to be consistent with the brand of where the merchandising is happening. Okay? So <clears throat> it's really important to understand the relationship between branding and merchandising. They're not the same, but they're like first cousins, if you think of it that way. So branding is the DNA of the look of a product, a company, um, a corporation, or even a person, you know, when you think about a personal brand. 
Merchandising is the implementation of the branding. Okay, so let me say that again. Branding is like the DNA of the look of something and merchandising is the implementation and the, the visual representation and, and it goes into some of the operations. So branding typically will create a style guide or some sort of sheet that says your Pantone color number is this and your logo can only be used this way and your tagline has to show or not show. Those are all elements of branding. But the merchandising takes that brand style guide and actually implements it into the world and gives it energy and defines how it's going to look in, say, a physical store. Okay? So it's a very important distinction. Um, so let's talk a little bit about why you need merchandising and how that typically works. You need merchandising, number one, because it produces an emotional response. And we human beings, we buy based on emotion and then we back it up with logic. There's research time and time again about this. And here's a really crazy statistic for you all, okay? So hang with me on this. Only about 32% of consumers use a list when they go into a store. 32% are using a list. And only about 47%, sorry, 47% rely on a mental list, okay? So of that 32%, only 47% of them have just a mental list. They don't even have a written list, right? So there's tremendous opportunity to influence what's happening when you're in a store. And the average consumer is going to see three thousand marketing messages in one day really three thousand marketing messages from different sources and in different ways in one day right so now here's the other really impactful statistic and that's this 16 percent of impulse purchases were influenced by the display and by the merchandising okay so all of those impulse purchases that are happening, 16% of them were influenced by the display and were caused by the display and the, the merchandising of the store and how it's looking. I, right? That's kind of insane. So when you think about it, um, the other trend that's going on is the decline in using a shopping list, okay? So over the past six years, it's been tracked that using a shopping list as a practice is dropping like a rock. So what's going on is people are more impulse driven and they're looking to be guided in their buying decision because there are over 30,000 SKUs launched in a year in the general US market. So that's just an average kind of number, but you think about that, it's, it's mind boggling, okay? So of the ways to get to a consumer, to, to get a message to them, only about 16% of consumers are paying attention to mailers, right? To physical mailers. And about 21% are even looking at circulars. You know, back in the day, there were these newspaper circulars that would show all the weekly specials, those kinds of things. Well, only 21% of consumers are paying attention to those now, right? So there's this enormous opportunity to drive purchases through merchandising. And it's become extremely important as a trend, all right? So um, let's talk to some examples of merchandising, then I'm going to open up the phone lines. So what is merchandising? Merchandising covers everything from where an item is placed in the store, um, to things like signage, what type of sign, where is it, the look of the sign, um, what's it communicating, because the average consumer can only absorb four to six feet of a store at, at a moment, right? So they have to think in segments in store layout. That's why most of the sections are laid out in 
four to six foot increments and you'll see signage like flag signs sticking out from the, the aisle and there's different things to help break up the aisle into digestible pieces for a consumer so it makes it easy to shop. Um, so this, the other pieces are something that's called the product facing. Um, that is how many times the product appears in a section. So if you have two peg hooks of it, that's two facings. Um, and how it hangs on the hook. You know, is the package readable? Is it legible? Can they understand it really quickly? It's super, super important. And also, if the product looks messy on the hook, you know, the store is not maintaining it, then what actually can happen is you can have a drop in sales because the product's all crooked or it's not back on the hook, it's on the, the base deck, which is the bottom shelf of a section of pegboard. And consumers find that very difficult to shop. And the ease of shopping is one of the top nine factors that determines the amount of sales that a product will do. So pretty, pretty important. Um, display videos are another element of merchandising. So whether you're going to use those and how they happen, um, and also demonstrations of the product. Are you gonna have somebody in the aisle giving out taste samples? Are you gonna have someone demonstrating it? Or is the store staff gonna be trained on how to demonstrate it? Um, those are all merchandising choices. And also the adjacent product placements. What's next to your product affects the sales. Does the flow of the store make sense is part of that adjacency. Um, when they lay out the planogram, are they laying it out in a logical way? And are you setting them up to win by um, making good suggestions? A lot of people don't realize that category managers are frequently hired and paid for by a manufacturer that's in that section, right? So some of the manufacturers are making some of the merchandising decisions for the store and making really strong recommendations. Pretty cool opportunity. We've done a ton of that kind of work for clients and it's very, very effective. Um, so the other thing that's frequently overlooked as an element of merchandising is the simple act of straightening up the store to make it easy to shop, right? Just straightening it up every day on a daily basis making sure that you've got something that um, is easy to find, easy to understand, and that people can absorb and digest the information about are all elements of your merchandising, okay? So with that, I see that we're just about a little bit before quarter after, and we've got another about 15, 20 minutes here. So I wanna make sure to leave room for questions. If you're on Facebook and you have a question, just type it in the comment box. I am paying attention to those. So um, do that. And then on the phone lines today, if you have a question, press star two, and that'll raise your hand so that I know to open up your line. Um, and then on the, the Q&A, we've got questions coming in already over there. Awesome. Um, so, oh, I see that we've got a comment from Jim. Um, wow, pretty cool range of folks. Yeah, these, these, this show has gotten really popular. We're really blessed that so many people get value out of it and are giving us great testimonials, great reviews about it. Um, so yeah, it's an awesome range of folks. I happen to know some of the products that are on here. So Jim, it's it runs the gamut. I know you've got a technology related product. We have other people that are doing baby products and pet products and um, car, car related things and hardware. So it's very, very diverse. Let's see. So there's a question here from Hillary. If I market my products, how many units would I need on hand to distribute? Will the packaging need any special codes or labels? Hillary, that's a great question. How many you need depends on how you're launching it and how big your launch is going to be. Also, where you're going to be launching it. Um, if you are launching through Amazon and you're getting a test order from them, like they're actually buying it, taking it into a distribution center, you, you'd be surprised how few you need on hand for that kind of test. You, it could be even 100 units um, 
to do that. If you were going to say a QVC, you could see that you'd need about $30,000 worth of inventory um, for the first test. It can range drastically depending on the price point and like I said, where you're selling. Um, the other question that Hillary had was, will the packaging need any special codes or labels? Um, I'm not sure what your product is, so it's really hard to answer that. You probably are going to need your own UPC codes um, if you are selling to majors, okay? So it depends, again, where you're selling. And if you're selling a nutrition product, then there's different labeling requirements than if you're selling a pet product. Um, so it depends on your category a bit. Hopefully that helps you. You can feel free to type another question if, if you've got a little bit more follow-up on that one. And let me go over to the phone lines. I see that we've got a question from a phone number ending in 3341. Hey, this is Amy. Who is this? Hi, Amy. This is Mike. Hey, Mike. I saw that we've got a conversation later today. I'm super excited. Oh, yeah, me too. I yeah. can't wait. Yeah, so... Great show. Oh, thank you. Um, so what's your question today? You mean for them to make the first purchase? Yes. Uh, not always. Um, videos can work really well. Good sell sheets can work well. Um, for your product in particular, because I happen to know it, Mike's actually one of our clients, um, it's probably going to need the video first, and then I would say you're probably going to be in a demo. Um, yours is a, you, you're going to have to take them outside probably when you do that demo, which buyers are willing to do. You know, they're they're willing to kind of go. Oh, okay, that's we need to go to a car or we need to go to a grassy area. That's fine. So. Okay. Yeah. Hey, but, you know. Yeah, but your video is is good at showing the use of the product. Okay. Okay. Good. Um. So, does that take care of your question? Okay. Uh, the second thing I had real quick was, uh, do we have a choice on where the products are placed in a store? That is a great question, Mike. I'm so glad somebody asked it. Yes. See, here's what most people don't get. The manufacturers can influence and suggest to buyers, okay? And so we've done things where we did a sales presentation to Walmart. Um, it was for the annual reset of an entire section that had 700 products in it. And so we actually relayed the entire section and removed duplicate products and of, of other manufacturers and of our own. We did it so that it made sense for the buyer, not just for us, like from a self-serving place. We did it as a service to the buyer. The buyer actually ended up taking 25% of our recommendations on what she should do with that section because we relayed it, we took pictures, we sent the product in, we actually went there and set it up in their, um, in their buyer meeting room. So we actually had literally 16 feet of pegboard that we merchandised the way we were suggesting, right? And it was all about making the section easy to shop and um, making it so that consumers could buy related items easily, okay? So yes, you absolutely can influence where the product is um, and that's even without paying things called slotting allowances. Slotting, slotting fees will also determine where things get placed um, and the kind of sale you're trying to do. Is it a seasonal promotional product or are you trying to be in the, what's called the uh, annual set, okay? The annual set is what's there for an entire year. Promotional is used to move seasonal items in and out, and it's used to prove new products. So you're probably gonna start out in testing in a promotional spot, and then you would move to inline if you're gonna be part of the annual set. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. 
Okay, I know I just used a lot of lingo there, but it's really important for people to get used to hearing that because I'd rather have you hear it from me and question me than have you be in a buyer meeting or get paperwork from a buyer and go, I have no idea what the heck this is, right? <laughs> Better to ask a safe place than the person you're trying to sell to if you can avoid it, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, it's like, oh, a place to ask that um, isn't going to expect you to already know, right? So, so with that, Mike, I'm going to mute your line for your privacy, okay? And I'll talk to you uh, later today, okay? Okay, thank you. Sure. So let's see. If you're on the phone line, press star two. That'll raise your hand. I know we have some Facebook Live questions coming in. Um, let's see if I can get to the previous ones. So let's see. Gayla, uh, she wants to double check on the size of UPC code that needs to be for retail stores. Uh, they have one, but uh, she thought I mentioned something more specific. Uh, oh, and thank you for the compliment. You're you're wonderful too. Um, so UPC codes, everybody, the size of the UPC code depends on the type of code. There's different types of barcodes. And so it depends on the product category and it also depends on the retailer. So it's really important to pay attention to UPC code sizes because um, you can get fined. For example, if your barcode doesn't scan well, for a retailer, they can actually find you. And it doesn't just count with retail, it can also happen with Amazon and different online entities. So really important. Um, for UPCs, you can talk about it in terms of percentage of size. So Gala, for your product, again, since you're a client, I know your, your product, you probably want to do at least a 100% size barcode. You don't need to go any bigger than that and you could probably go down to about 90% because that should be accepted by Petco and PetSmart, okay? Um, so go to a 90% size would be fine and that'll help you with getting a little bit more space on your label because I know that's why you're asking. Um, so they, the barcode graphic will generate at a particular size and your graphics um, designer can scale it down to a 90% of that size okay so that'll take care of that question and then I know we've got another one here ah oh, Rita Paulino joining us oh um, she's got a great new sauce I'm really excited to try it so uh, let's see another question from Gala what is the best way to approach retail outlets with our products send a letter to the marketing person with a sample or a call where do we start great question um, it's not the marketing person there's different roles inside retailers um, and the new training that we're putting out is gonna go into this a bit. So you actually are going to be speaking with a buyer rather than the marketing manager. Marketing manager handles the marketing of the store or of the business. The merchandising managers and the buyers handle the actual product that's there, okay? So typically um, you want to uh, find the buyer's name, phone number, email, etc. Um, I know that we have some, you have Gala, you're on the list on Wednesday for me to look in our database for you. I know that we've got some contacts for you for the pet industry. Um, so you would actually call them most likely and then you, they, you tell them a little bit about the product. You may show them a, a video. I know you have some and then they would ask you to send it in. You want to avoid going through the product submission process on their websites, if you can at all, and go direct to the decision makers. It's a, a much more effective process, okay? Um, so where you start is with research, and there's a lot of ways to find different buyers and their contact info. For our clients, we actually look in our database, and we have one of the largest databases of buyers um, that you can possibly have. One of our clients, we sent them 135 contacts to major, major, major players. So um, 
I know that we've got a, a few of our clients on this call and just for everybody's sake, um, I know that we're looking up buyers for Dina and uh, Sue, um, Gayla, I'm trying to think who else. We have a, a list to do on Friday, so we'll be in the database then, okay? Um, so Gayla, let me know if that answers your questions, all right? Just type a comment over in Facebook. And if you're on the phones, press star two, raise your hand. And I'm gonna just double check our webcast and see what's happening over there. Okay, looks like the webcast is clear and the phone lines are clear. So merchandising, one other thing I wanna say about it really quickly, there's, there's nine elements that affect the merchandising of any products or the store itself. And so I can run through those really quickly if anybody's interested, let me know. Um, we've got the list of them here. Um, and we've got about five more minutes. So if you have any more questions, this is your time, okay? So merchandising and, oh, I know a question that frequently comes up that you may not be thinking to ask, and that is this. How does packaging relate to merchandising, right? Packaging is part of merchandising. It's part of the manufacturer's merchandising of their product, right? Their product line. Merchandising also comes into play when you're doing a trade show. When you're thinking through how people are going to flow through a trade show booth, that's part of your merchandising, okay? Um, merchandising will drive a lot of sales and interest or it will alienate people. For example, if any, who, who's been in a Rite Aid recently, um, past, I don't know, four years maybe, five years, um, I cannot stand the merchandising of that store. <laughs> Makes me a little crazy, right? Because they intentionally went to a Chevron aisle pattern instead of going front to back for most of the stores now, they go with this angle from the front door and it feels really difficult to find things. That is a merchandising decision that because of my professional background with this, um, I know for me that that store design wastes my time, right? So I will intentionally not go into a Rite Aid because I know that if I go in Rite Aid, it's gonna take me longer than if I go in CVS, right? CVS is a well-merchandised store. I can find everything really fast. Their store staff all knows where things are. Those are all related to the merchandising of that store, right? Rite Aid's design is meant to get me to browse and to look around to see what I can find. And that makes me crazy. <laughs> it just bothers me no end to have that be something that they want me to do with my time, right? Because the longer I stay in the store, the statistics show that the more that I'll spend, right? So I don't like that kind of um, merchandising manipulation. Okay? I don't think that that has um, the greatest respect for the consumer. So that merchandising decision actually has cost them my business in many, many cases. So um, when you think through merchandising, it's really important how it's coming across to your consumer, right? So if your packaging is hard to understand or doesn't communicate the product, um, then what actually happens is they get frustrated, right? And of the nine elements that build merchandising that's successful, ease of shopping is one of them. Ease of absorbing information so it keeps them out of overwhelm is actually very important because a confused mind won't buy, all right? So with that, I know we've got another question on the phone line and we've got another one on the, the Facebook. So I'm gonna handle the Facebook one and I'll come back to the phone lines. Oh good, Gayla, I'm glad that that helped you. Um, so her other question is, oh perfect, can we work together with you to help me develop our phone commercial for lack of a better description so I feel more prepared to do so? Absolutely, we do this all the time. We also do email. Uh, composition with some of our clients where they've wanted to get a certain retailer calling them back and nothing's happening and we dictate 
uh, in one example in particular with one of our clients with Walmart Canada, she wasn't hearing back. It had been two weeks that she was getting really antsy and anxious about it. And she opened up an email while we were on a, a, a phone call and I dictated four sentences for her to send. And by the time we had finished the phone call, she'd already heard back from them. So about 45 minutes from when she clicked send to when she had an answer. So yes, we absolutely can help you with that. Okay. So uh, let's see. The other question is over on the phone line. And I'm super excited to hear this uh, voice coming across. So if your phone number ends in 1342... Your phone line's open. Hi, Sue. Hey, how are you? I'm so excited to hear your voice. How are you? I'm doing awesome. We, we've uh, had a busy time uh, closing up my mom's house and things, and it's but it's all good. What's your question today? Well, I totally agree with you with the writing that you were saying, and the CVS that agreed to me, too. But <laughs> the question is, now some commercials, like, you know, um, they have, is there also, like, ways to do, like, um, that they do subliminal um, things to get you to buy products also? Um, commercials on TV? Like, when you have a product, if you put it on a commercial, uh -huh. isn't there things that they do that, like, to buy? Oh, yeah. Like a subliminal, you know how you put Definitely. it in a store, there's things that, yes. Definitely. Some of the things that are happening, um, no matter where you fall on the political spectrum, actually Donald Trump used some um, neuro-linguistic programming techniques with his speeches. Um, commercials do the same thing. Next time, if you guys want to hear an interesting um, example of how to do scripting on things. Next time you are watching TV or you're looking at something and you're hearing a car commercial, right? I want you to close your eyes, don't pay attention to the image, but close your eyes and listen to the words and the sound of the commercial, right? Just the nature of it. Yep. Um, because if you think about it, like Mazda's old slogan of Zoom Zoom, was all about mm -hmm. speed and excitement and that's who they were trying to sell to were people that wanted you know the Miata convertible and the like so they were trying to communicate this fun um, energy right so they chose taglines that related to that all the sound inside the commercial relates to that um, some of the things about subliminal advertising and commercials is the scripting which involves like word pictures that are being created, the images that are being put up. Um, I'm gonna just go to my list here because this relates to your question. So um, the nine attributes of effective merchandising are appeal, attention, clear product communication, personal relevance, do they feel like that product is for them, okay? Um, browsing, that it's a high quality product, that there is ease of shopping, right? Um, and that the merchandising helps shoppers decide. And the ninth one is differentiation of products, okay? So commercials take advantage of the differentiation of product. They also will uh, go for the appeal by the colors and the aspirational message. If you watch a Mercedes commercial, for example, it's very aspirational, right? It shows luxury, it shows quality, it's got this kind of zen feel to it. You get what I mean, Sue? Yep, and jingles too, like uh, ba -da -ba -ba -ba, like McDonald's, they all have like jingles that you can, that's catchy to it too. Right, that are catchy, that have a pattern to them, and they use repetition to get you to remember it so that it hooks in, okay? So yep. those are all subliminal techniques is the repetition um, and then the word pictures and getting it to seem appealing um, with QVC, for example, or HSN, um, they use a lot of call in things like they'll talk about the product and it's all about romancing the product. I know this because we sold $300 million worth of product in three years on QVC. So it was all about romancing the product. It was the story, it was the quality, the quality was part of the story. 
So it was the words that we used and the way it got displayed and talked about. And then you get a call in person coming in who's bought something else from that line before or from QVC before who talks about, oh my gosh, you know, that was so amazing. I'm so happy I bought it, which is the social proof element that seals the deal a lot of times. Does that make sense? Yes, definitely. Thank you. Sure. That's all part of merchandising. So great question. Thank you for bringing it up. I love that. Thank you. Nice talking to you. Yeah, it's good to hear you. Um, so I'm going to mute your line for your privacy. And I think that's our last question for today. If anybody's got one more burning questions, uh, question, I see we've got um, a couple on Facebook. Let me just see if I can get that. Um, Ah, uh, Rita, thank you so much. Rita's comment was, you're so sweet and happy and kind of you giving your time to us. You know, I look at this like it's um, investing into people and that the karma points will win and it'll it'll help everybody, including us. And um, so let's see, Gayla's next question. What do you feel is the best with e-commerce product sales? Increase product price and offer free shipping or vice versa? Ooh. You know, free shipping, um, that's a tricky one right now because Amazon kind of moved that equation um, with the Prime deal. You know, everybody feels like it's free shipping, but they forget that they're actually paying uh, to have that Prime account for 70, $75 a year, I think is what it still is. Um, so do you increase the product price and offer free shipping or vice versa, which means decrease the product price and charge for shipping I think is your other option right um, so when it comes to this um, you really want to think about it in terms of how is it going to be perceived right um, if you're not confident on your shipping costs then you may have to charge separately for the shipping if you really see a big swing and everybody you got to remember when you're looking at online selling you were looking at international sales and if you're going to ship outside the US the shipping cost changes dramatically and um, we know of some cases where people were charging um, I think it was $35 how did it go they were charging $35 for the product they offered free shipping and when they started getting international orders the shipping was going to cost $50 um, the way that they had said they were going to ship it. So they actually had to really um, reconfigure everything. So it depends on your product. It depends on how else you want to sell. Um, so you want to look at it like it's not just a decision for your online, but also for any offline sales or corporate accounts you want to do. Um, because they're going to back out a shipping cost and know what your price is anyway. So that is something that we should have more conversation about one-on-one. Um, -on -one. I know Gail is a client. We do a lot of work on pricing and that's that pricing decision right now it's kind of assumed that when you see free shipping you sort of know that somehow you're paying for it. Um, it does mask it and it reduces the friction in the sale which can be very good. So um, you can also split test it. You could do A-B testing you know, I have two separate pages, one with a higher price and shipping included and another sales page that's identical where you change the, um, where you change the value proposition so you have a lower price but you charge shipping. Then you run traffic to both of those and see which your market responds to, okay? So with that, um, I hope that answers your question. Oh, and thank you so much. I love, I'm glad that you're uh, liking the, the silk top today. For everybody who's on the phone line, I'm wearing a hand-painted silk top, and Gayla thinks it looks awesome. So, um, oh, and Anya, you've checked in. Awesome. Anya's another client of ours um, who's doing some really great things. So with that, I'm going to go to our webcast one last time, see if there's any questions there. Okay, well, it looks like our questions on the webcast are done. And if there's no more questions on the phone line, we'll wrap for today. So phone line, last time, press star two, raise your hand. 
Um, you'll be our last question if there is one over there. Um, and if not, um, we will wrap for the day. Okay, I think we are done everybody. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a training that is coming out. You'll see an email. I want to make sure that we have answered the things that people want answered in that training. So I'm going to actually ask you a couple questions in email if you wouldn't mind. Please give me a reply back so that we can make sure that we designed a training that's of service to you. So with that, everybody, um, thank you so much for joining us and following us on Facebook and being on these calls. It means a lot um, to have you here. And oh, one other thing, for anybody who's in the Los Angeles area, um, I have been asked to keynote speak at the San Fernando Valley Business Journal Women in Business Awards Luncheon. So I'll be their keynote speaker on April 26th. Uh, we will have information if you want to pick up a ticket for that. You can come out. It's, I think, in Woodland Hills. Um, and so I'll be doing about a half hour talk during their uh, program for the day. And it'll be all about um, the journey and inspiring people to move to action inside their business and reinvent themselves continually. So um, I'm really excited about it. I haven't uh, been doing a whole lot of speaking lately. And also for anybody in the Los Angeles area, we have a face uh, a meetup group. We actually have two of them. You can find out about them over on productstoprofits.com slash meetup. Um, there's one called Product Mastery that is all for product people. We have about 200 people in that. And then we have one for startup entrepreneurs. Um, so the content that's over there is really good. On Wednesday night, we're actually doing a movie screening at our office. We're taking over the gigantic screen, and we've got beer and tea and coffee and popcorn, um, so everybody can come out and watch the movie Joy with us. And then we'll talk about what it's really like to sell on QVC and HSN, because like I said, we've got a, quite a bit of experience with that. So um, if you're in the area and you want to come out for it, um, we will definitely be uh, doing that. It's Wednesday night at 6. Um, Jeff is hosting it. So, um, And if anybody's interested and you want me to do a call like this or a show on specifically selling to QVC and HSN, I'd be happy to do that for you. Um, it will be part of the training that we're doing as well. So with that, everybody, I really appreciate your heart, your energy, and uh, you investing time to really move the world and, and change everything for somebody. You know, some of the projects that I know are on this, this phone call um, are pretty amazing. And um, I just teared up thinking about how we get to serve you. And I'd love to work with each and every one of you. You know, we have some some things that we're investing in and growing in for our clients. And uh, that takes, you know, all of us stepping in and, and working together. So um, if you've been waiting on the sidelines and you're looking for help and you want to be more successful faster, please contact us. I'd love to work with you um, and really help you move forward. Uh, we've got some great different options and you'll see messages about some of that later this week. So with that, everybody, I am going to sign off for today. Um, check out the blog. We've got a ton of content going up over there. Uh, the team is doing a really great job. And so I'm super blessed. I'm going to open up the phone lines if anybody wants to say goodbye. You can. Uh, phone lines are all open. So happy Monday, everybody, and I'll talk to you in two weeks. Bye, Amy. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye, everybody. Bye. The conference is now completed. Goodbye. So thank you so much for being on the Facebook Live. I really appreciate you hanging with us. And uh, Rita, it's great to see you. I did see your text about pricing. Um, that's definitely something we can work on um, with some consulting when you're ready. And Gayla, I'm really excited to see what your labels are, are doing. I know you sent an email about that. So um, I'll be back in email later today. So for anybody who's a client, I know we've got some uh, replies pending to you. And if you're not already a client,
please become a client. It helps everybody. Um, we can move you forward and help you uh, have the business that you really want to have. So with that, everybody, uh, blessings for you for this week. And thank you for joining us today. Bye.